Hey climbers, welcome back to Climb by VSC, a weekly show about building and scaling startups in the world of climate innovation. My name is Jacob Poor, general partner of VSC Ventures and co-host of Climb. Every week, I or a member of our VSC team will speak with a pioneer in the climate tech world about emerging technologies and novel ideas that will turn the tide on climate change. We've all heard enough of the doom and gloom. It's time for stories of purpose-driven innovation that lead to sustainable, positive change. As always, I'm so happy that you've decided to join us. Now let's climb. Hey, climbers, welcome back to another episode of Climb by VSC. I am so excited about this one because, you know, during the writer strike in Hollywood, there's not a lot of content coming out of Hollywood. But as I can tell you today, there's a ton of content coming out of my guest, Molly Wood. Molly Wood is the founder and CEO of Mollywood Media, an independent journalism and investing firm focused on climate solutions. Molly spent many years as a journalist covering the evolution of technology at places like Marketplace on NPR, New York Times, CBS. And she started covering climate technology in 2018, which makes you the veteran, Molly, I think, in this space. <laughs> uh, she's also spent time as a venture investor, most recently as a managing director at Launch, where she co-hosted This Week in Startups. And at Mollywood Media, she's combining both her career paths into a new company. And highly recommend, once you finish listening to this episode, to go check out Everybody in the Pool, uh, which is a podcast and accompanying newsletter as well. So Molly, there's so much for us to unpack today. I just want to start by saying thank you so much for joining me on Climb. Jay, I'm delighted. Thanks for having me. I think this is going to be so fun. I think so too. I think, you know, as we were chatting off mic, like there's so much mission alignment here that this is going to be a really fun, fun episode. So just so our listeners learn a little bit more about you, they kind of understand your journey and, and your passion for this space. You know, you've had a unique trajectory from kind of tech focus or general tech focus journalism, I'll say, to public radio, to VC. Mm -hmm. Was there kind of a moment where it, it drove a shift in your interest in telling climate stories and kind of give us that that journey a little bit? I mean, I think I'm like so many people in that the awareness of the climate crisis, you know, I mean, I was, I remember when Inconvenient Truth came out and the conversation about the ozone layer and all of these sort of increasingly urgent conversations about climate. And I had been a very like you said, a, a business reporter, a tech reporter specifically, and I just didn't know a way in to that story. So it was sort of bugging me, <laughs> if you will. And then sort of a couple things all happened at once. I read a lot of sci-fi and I happened to be reading um, this book by Kim Stanley Robinson called New York 2140, which is about New York City and global finance after two successive 50 foot sea level rises. And there was this mention in this book about diamond coating around the bottom of buildings that was keeping water out so that people could still just live in Manhattan and do business. And I had this moment, I was the host of a show called Marketplace Tech, which was a national you know, public radio show. And I thought, okay, well, wait a second, who's working on that? Like, could somebody be building these types of solutions? And I really got interested in adaptation. I just had you know, been reading more and more IPCC reports that were all kind of saying the same thing, which is some of this is baked in, a lot of this is baked in, and we're going to have to maybe engineer our way out of it. And I just had this moment of realizing that it was my story and that it was profoundly a business story. I credit a lot of it to that book, which was literally about survival, technology, and global finance. And it just kind of all clicked into place as so many, because that's exactly what kind of nerd I am. If sci-fi shows me a way, I'm going through that door. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's so interesting how much of, I think, the climate crisis, especially for the newer generation, right? As I, as I talk to folks in their 20s or even coming out of college now, it's, it's become personal. And there was a really great article mm -hmm. uh, Rachel Wolf wrote on Wall Street Journal talking about how you know, people are becoming nocturnal in the summers. It's, I think, both optimistic that you know there's adaptation happening and then yet also doom and gloom sets in which is like, where is this action coming from? In your time as a journalist, did that make you more optimistic? I mean, I know a lot of people who have been covering climate for a long time and they are, it's tough. I mean, yeah. it is a really emotionally taxing job. And I think it's partly because business of journalism, now that I'm a little bit on the other side, that we're kind of addicted to what I call problem porn. And in many ways, I think that I spoke to a group of climate reporters and they specifically said, well, how can you cover this without advocating? And I was like, yeah. why wouldn't you be advocating? The, the goal of great journalism ultimately is outcomes. But the job of journalism day to day many times is to just sort of outline the problem, drop that baby off at the doorstep and hope that somebody picks it up and adopts it and takes care of it and does something yeah. later. 
Yeah. That is grinding and miserable. I feel very lucky that I was on a show that could really focus on solutions, that I could say in answer to that question, is anybody building this? Let's go find the people who are. Let's go knock on the doors of Apple and Facebook and Microsoft. You know, I went sort of bopping around the valley, knocking on the doors of big tech companies and venture capitalists and saying, you promised us tech was going to save the world. What are you doing? What are you working on? Honestly, what's amazing is, you know, we started talking about this series in probably 2016, 2017, launched in 2018. I could only find like about two startups who were really genuinely building. You know, one of them is now known as Source and it's, it's you know, those panels that suck water out of the air. It was incredible. Every time I stumbled across somebody who was building one of these solutions, it was just a dopamine hit of hope. It's amazing to me to see how hard it was to find them then and how they're everywhere now and the people really yeah. are doing it. Yeah. And is, is that somewhat uh, kind of leading you into becoming an investor then going from, hey, I'm, I'm obviously shedding light on this and, and I'm trying to spur action, but now here's something maybe different that I can do uh, as an investor. Talk to me about that journey yeah. going from journalism to, to investing and uh, maybe what some of the pleasant surprises that happened as you as you made that transition. Really, that's exactly what happened is I thought, okay, people are working on this. I, how can I have a more direct impact? And I will confess that a part of me was like, I don't have time to change minds. You know, storytelling is slow or it's inefficient or journalism organizations are in some cases still very resistant to climate coverage, which they consider to be boring content that nobody is going to read. I was just feeling antsy. I was just chopping at the bit. Like, how can I give some people some money so they can get some stuff done? You know, was lucky enough to know someone who had previously been a journalist who had a fund and, you know, we'd had a long relationship and got the opportunity to move into venture, which is a hard thing to do. And it was exactly the fire hose of hope that I would have wanted it to be. I mean, every conversation that you have with founders and other climate investors, I mean, talk about a collaborative, phenomenal community of people rowing in the same direction. What I found is that in some ways it's different from generalist venture in some kind of profound and wonderful ways in that it's so collaborative and that it really is mission driven, but ultimately capitalist endeavor. I think probably the thing that surprised me the most coming out of journalism, because going from public radio to venture capital is a specifically large culture shift, as you might imagine. <laughs> but I'm not going to lie to you. I love how clean the incentive is. We yeah. want to build something great that makes everybody a lot of money. Because that's the best chance for impact that we have. I surprised myself with my embrace of capitalism. <laughs> no, it's you know it's it's interesting. It, what what triggered for me there is like this word impact, right? I think people sort of in the venture world look at impact investing as a very specific bucket mm -hmm. where LPs are going to allocate capital, or you as a founder are going to take impact investing funds onto your cap table. And yet, you know, climate investing is impact in a way, maybe not in that sort of definition of. We're helping sort of an underprivileged group or, or, or an underrecognized group, but it is ultimately at the end of the day making an impact. I think the biggest shift for me as somebody who's now been sort of studying this space in climate 1.0 versus what we're seeing today is that it's not being talked about as impact. It's being talked about as industrial adaptation or you know yeah. climate community adaptation. Maybe let's click on that one piece about it being vegetables though. Like that, That's a very interesting framing to me. I'm seeing so many publications have climate desks and yes. have folks that want to cover this. So is climate storytelling still kind of dry and, and, and something that folks need to do? Or in what ways have you seen that change? I am starting to see the climate desks. I believe and evangelize that we are living in the climate economy. There is no question that every part of our lives and business is going to change. And there's a point at which something becomes a big enough story in day-to-day -day life, economic life, and kind of activism and injustice where it's it's unavoidable. And this is this is a story that has all of that. You have people being harmed who did not cause the problem in the first place. You have unbelievable systemic financial risk and opportunity, and you have this disaster. And there's nothing lo news loves more than disaster. I'm sorry. It finally, I do, I do think, has all of the elements to be unavoidable enough that news organizations are really starting to cover it. I will tell you that the best coverage I see is in the Financial Times, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal. It's solutions oriented, it's practical, it's unemotional. When you put this in the context of a business story, one, you reach a broader audience. It, it's not in the kind of like climate desk, it's the economy desk. <laughs> it's where I used yeah. to joke actually that at some point being a tech reporter was gonna be so 
silly and redundant because like, what do you have electricity reporters? It's just life, you know? You're so spot on about that. I mean, one of the most profitable or valuable companies out there is a climate company. If you consider Tesla and the massive yeah. shift to EVs, which I, I do and I, I think you do as well, that is a climate technology company. 100%. And it is it is so ubiquitous. And, and yet, and when we raised our fund and we spoke to LPs and, and there was a little bit of convincing that we had to do that like, hey, one of the pillars of this fund is going to be climate adaptation. There are some folks that sort of say, well, is, is that a, a big enough market? It's one of those things where like, yeah, you, I saw your eyes go wide. My, my, my eyes went wide as well. Where you're like, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Because it, it, it is impacting sort of so much of everything we do. All these other things that are happening in, you know, Web3 and decentralization won't won't matter if there mm -hmm. isn't sort of a planet. A total addressable. I mean, I say this all the time. This is a total addressable market of the entire world. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. And it's our job to Man. create these innovations, adopt them. I mean, you know, Tesla is in many ways setting aside whatever you have to set aside to t have a re an objective conversation about Tesla, which is not just an electric car company. Yeah. It's also a battery maker. Yeah. and a solar panel distribution company yeah. and a charging infrastructure company. It is like, it's the exit. Yeah. You know, a lot of yeah. times you hear people in climate talk about, well, what are the, what are the examples to follow? Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. These are technologies and innovations that will be adopted at the early adopter end when they're really expensive right. and will become mass market and then will become available to the entire planet. Not to mention just the, the legislation, the, the CHIPS Act, the infrastructure bill, and the Inflation Reduction Act. Obviously, the IRA is the one that gets talked about as the climate bill. All three of them catalyze probably, and this might even be a conservative estimate, $3 trillion in government spending toward climate adaptations, innovations, research and development, and deployment. We know that private money follows public money at something like a three to one ratio. So you're now talking about like $12 trillion annually it, there's not a bigger market on earth, period. Every company is also a climate company. Yeah, yeah, I, I really like that. So going a little bit deeper into this sort of transition that you've made from journalist to investor, I'm, I'm so curious, did it change the way you, you know, interviewed or, or sort of heard pitches from founders? Maybe you picked up on a little bit more when you were writing about them as a journalist versus when you were looking to allocate capital as an investor, what are two or three things that you looked for? It has been such an interesting evolution because I think at first I thought in s there are some things about the skill set that are pretty one to one. You know, it really is. It's interviewing. It's listening. It's asking questions. It's picking up on things. It's being appropriately skeptical. But I had this really kind of interesting dichotomy where I would sometimes talk to founders on This Week in Startups, the podcast, and then I would talk to them as in an investment meeting. And I would realize all the stuff they didn't tell me when I was acting in a slightly more journalistic capacity. And so I'm sorry to say that one of the things I may have realized is that we don't actually know anything. Whatever you read in the news is like less than half the story. You don't actually know how, how the company makes money. You don't know how much they make. You don't know what their business model really is. You don't know how many people work there. You don't know what their goals are in terms of where they want to get and when. You get the version of that story that is appropriate to you, the journalist, and it's like maybe half of the story. Wow. I just found it very interesting, the kind of level of information that is available to you as an investor compared to what is available to you as a journalist. And it made me go back and look at a lot of the reporting I had done and think like, this is really not, I won't say that I gave people inaccurate information, but man, when there was a lot under the surface that maybe yeah. I couldn't, would now know to ask a little bit more about. It is interesting when you see folks um, who kind of walk that line. There's that TC to VC pipeline joke. People say, you know, TechCrunch writers that go on and end up working at, at VC. And then yep. I see a few of them come back and I, I've never actually gone back and said, I wonder if they're digging in on, on certain topics a little bit more, you know, just in terms of like stories we saw in, in the recent past, WeWork, Theranos, where yep. they were media darlings. And then under the hood, there was sort of a very, very different story. The funniest thing happened for me when I sort of became an early investor, the first company that I was on the board of, my mentor was telling me, he goes, you know, the first board meeting is actually when you find out what you actually bought. Right. Because <laughs> even as an investor, you're hearing so much and you think you're getting the full story. And then you get in the board meeting and you go, yep, this thing that I told you about that wasn't a big deal, it's, that's that's existential. It's a, huge that's a big deal. deal. Yeah. <laughs> it's a huge deal. So also it's, it's that. certainly a transition. It's certainly also a that. transition. 
Um, is, you know, as you are meeting some of these founders and, and you know, we can talk about it both in, in the lens of the podcast where you're talking about promising technologies or even the, the climate founders that you're speaking to, are there one or two that really stood out to you as, you know, folks you had to work with and, and maybe give us a story of how they came to be a part of your portfolio? I can think of two. <laughs> so one of the categories that I became really kind of obsessed mm -hmm. with is measurement. What I love are the sort of unexpected climate solutions, because so much of this is behavior change. So much of this is, I, I think of the problem itself as an ecosystem, like a planet, like you, you know, it's very tempting, I think, um, as an investor or a journalist to get obsessed with the like charismatic megafauna, you know, I'm just into giraffes and jaguars and like the tallest trees and, but none of that can grow without the sort of dirt and bacteria layer. I think what we're seeing now, even in climate venture specifically, is a sort of a shaking out of like, where does our money belong? What is actually venture scale? What is appropriate for this asset class to invest in? Is it charismatic megafauna? Is it fusion? You know, or is it bugs and bacteria, which might be like boring carbon accounting software? Or this whole category that I sort of broadly call measurement, which is like, what are all the things that we're doing? Because the key to sustainability is efficiency. And there's so much stuff that we're just doing that is stupid <laughs> that if we just put some sensors and software on, we could probably have major measurable impact, sort of making ourselves aware of the problem. Like this is unquestionably a, a huge issue that nobody knew about. And now we have the data. So my favorite investment in this category is a company I'm still on the board of called Clarity. Uh, they measure air pollution. And air pollution is sort of simultaneously the symptom of driver of climate change in a lot of ways. Like, And there's a difference between measuring greenhouse gas emissions and pollution. Right. The pollution is the symptom of all of our fossil fuel burning that kills 9 million people a year. And it's yeah. a, and for this company, hopefully it's a short hop to measuring greenhouse gas emissions also. But what I love about it as a story and a, a key technology is that it's a way in for a lot of people too. You don't have to be totally sold on the effects of global warming to understand that pollution is bad and that it happens <laughs> yeah. because of burning coal or oil, uh, releasing toxic emissions from inefficient landfills. Measuring that stuff in some ways is the key to driving action. So I, that's one of my darlings in the sort of unexpected way. And then the other one that I just want to exist more than anything is uh, the very first founder that I talked to as an investor in the very first investment I made, which is Eat Spring which is zero waste grocery delivery. It was so educational on so many levels because it's where I realized that there's a difference between like what you want to exist and what you can sometimes do operationally. Doing a logistics operation. They're sourcing food from wholesale, repackaging it, delivering it in Teslas, and there's a better margin than grocery in that business. But man, is that business hard to pull off. And so I learned so much about how hard it is to pull off the business that you want to exist. You know, in, in both of those examples, I think what's really interesting, and, and you hinted at it uh, in your in your previous answer, about what makes something venture scale, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's been sort of the Achilles heel of the space is what is an infrastructure project? What is actually investment on a venture timeline? And what is something that, you know, is sort of great consumer scale, a better consumer alternative, but ultimately not a billion dollar business and not something that you're going to get venture funds excited about. What is sort of your way to measure that as you're meeting these founders? Uh, and what are maybe some some signals for our listeners who are founders uh, where they can actually project the one that, that makes sense for the investor they're talking to? One of the possibly best sort of single phrase lessons I got in this experience was um, from our president actually at launch who told me that the, the company that breaks your heart the most is the really good $40 million business. Because you're like, that's an incredible business that may not be venture scale. What I think founders have to understand is that you may be the great $40 million business and you have to know that and be honest about it and talk to me, the investor, about where you fit in my portfolio. You know, we all know that every fund wants 100 to 500x, but to return our fund, we depend on some number of 10x's. This is a sophisticated thing to ask a founder to understand. But to the extent that you, the founder, can understand and be honest about where your business is, you help us with portfolio construction. Like yeah. you help by saying, this is our TAM. I've been really honest about it. I've done a bottom up TAM. I did not say I appeal to every single climate buyer in the entire on the planet. You know, you've been straightforward about who's really going to buy this. And if you can understand where you fit in the portfolio, 
That's such a superpower. Understanding venture as a founder is so powerful because there are times when you are a great investment and you don't understand why this fund didn't take you. And it's because they have a competitor. It's because they're full up on 10 X's that, you know, every, they've got their kind of set of priorities that don't match yours. But I do think there is still an argument for these businesses and that that climate funds, I think, have to have and are having interesting conversations about how to apply the kind of the power law. It's like, are we more of a money ball approach where our goal is lots and lots of 10 X's? I've seen so few money ball funds work in software. I think a lot of folks are burned uh, from that experience, but, but ultimately so this has to exist. And, and maybe it's not venture. Maybe it doesn't look like traditional venture capital. Maybe it looks like you know, mid cap private equity totally. and the LPs that they have that actually believe in these kinds of call it, you know, five to 10 X returns. Whereas for us who are building on, let's say a portfolio of 30 investments where the bulk of the value is in 10 of them. And even within that 10, the power law says there's probably two or three that are yep. driving the returns. You know, the, those 10 X has become challenging. The other big argument happening in climate tech investing is, are we frontier tech? Are we hardware? Mm. Everybody wants to stay away from hardware and invest in the winning business models of like SaaS, you know, in climate. What if actually the power law approach for venture is to find Teslas, right? Or to find the Eat Spring, to do the really operationally insane kinds of investments because those are the biggest possible returns as opposed to what you're seeing, which is more of a like, well, we'll just do software because it makes a lot of money. Maybe we're wrong. Well, VCs pattern match, right? So I think that's the other is challenge. It? Like it's hardening for me to hear that, you know, of the 16 investments we've made, six, seven of them have some kind of hardware component. Yeah. And we're very lucky that we have LPs that sort of believe in that strategy and support us in that. And, and ultimately we think that that's kind of where the opportunity is over the next 10 years. But there's a lot of investors where I'll send a deal and they say, Jay, I don't touch hardware. Like, well, you haven't even looked at it. You haven't heard about it. I just don't touch it. I just have, have had bad experiences with hardware. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I get it from their perspective, right? I don't agree with it, but I get it. Um, but, but ultimately, it's really the, the founder who has to tell that story and say, well, I know hardware. You, you have to trust me as the founder that I know actually how to get this to scale, which dovetails into a question I have for you, Molly, because you've now heard hundreds, if not thousands of pitches. What are two or three things that make a really compelling, from a storytelling aspect, founder pitch? And let's let's keep it early stage because that's most of our, our listeners. Your economics. Probably the biggest shift in thinking that I had to make was um, trying not to get sold on the story. I love a story. And mm -hmm. was, of course, the very stereotypical new investor who wanted to invest in everything that I saw. Like, I'm this is amazing. The, the company who really can talk about their economics, even at that early stage, if you understand your unit economics, if your accounting strategy is strong, if you are accruing revenue and recognizing revenue in the right way, um, if you know what your ongoing revenue strategy is going to be and who your buyers are and you can bring me customers, it turns out that that's the different language from being a journalist that I had to learn as an investor. Like your customer story, why they need to buy this is so powerful. One of the things that we would do at launch that I found phenomenally valuable is like as part of the diligence process early, even before we got to deep diligence, talk to customers. Why do you have to have this? So if a company comes to me, I can think of a specific company that was in that $40 million bucket, came to me and said, talk to my customer. And the customer was someone who one of their suppliers said, hey, I can't keep contracting with you unless you have an ESG strategy. And this is like a mid-sized business who isn't going to bring in PricewaterhouseCoopers and spend, you know, $250,000 in six months, like figuring out a full, yeah, they need basically like a pop-up strategy. And went on LinkedIn, found this company, this brand new startup, hired them because they had to, and then became an investor. They're, they're, you're not going to get a better customer story than that, right? Like, why are you necessary? How do you make money? And who are you going to make money from? Exactly. Well, the, the piece you spoke about in terms of like going out from a VC perspective and actually speaking to customers directly, that has been the nicest change from 2021 to 2023 for me. Because deals were mov moving so quickly in 2021 right. that you would say, oh, this is a great company. Your economics makes sense. Um, let me speak to a couple of customers. Between the time that you got on the call you know, with the founder so by the time you scheduled a call with the customer, the round was already full. And now at least, you know, we're, we're looking at a company in the concrete space 
I've spoken to four or five concrete plant, you know, owners and, and GMs and things like that, where I can say, okay, what do you need, right? Is this the thing you need today? I know this is the thing you need in the future, but this company may not, you know, survive long enough to service that future need. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very underlooked piece. And I tell founders too, the easier you can make it for your VCs to connect with customers, the better your diligence process is going to go because mm-hmm. there's no substitute for that. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear that that's actually a big part of your uh, your process as well, Molly. Let's flip it the other way. What are some mistakes you see on the pitch side where our listeners, when they're going into the next VC conversation or next journalist conversation, should avoid? Yeah, this is one of the interesting parts about the journey to becoming a VC was realizing that at the moment that I stepped away from storytelling, oh my God, we need so much storytelling. And we need storytelling within firms. Founders need storytelling, particularly in the climate space, because a lot of times you're telling multiple stories. There's the story of your business and you as the founder and your idea. There's the story of your economics. And then there's the story of a market that may be brand new or not completely mature yet that you're hoping to grow alongside of. And that is one of the kind of, I think, additional risks. You know, VCs will tell you, you want to find a company that will create a market that didn't exist before right? Uber is that company. Airbnb is that company. For some reason, that is a harder story to tell when it comes to climate, even though you may be creating markets that don't exist before, but or are the seeds of which are being planted right now that are super necessary. So I would urge the VCs listening to this to put put yourself in that mindset, right? You're, yes, you're hearing about something that sounds kind of risky because you're like, I don't know if anybody wants to buy zero waste groceries right now, when the truth is they will in a year or two or two months. For founders, you have to tell all of those stories. This shouldn't be that hard because knowing your market is your whole job. Product market fit is your entire, is your one job. So to the extent that you can tell me, I understand this market, I think that's a huge, huge part of it. And then I just, listen, like I want to take all of the brilliant PhDs who are founding the coolest climate tech companies and then, and just be like, here's a storytelling workshop. Because yeah. you have to put this in human. You have to assume that whoever you're talking to doesn't know anything about what you're saying. You should start the conversation by saying, how much do you know about like waste to value chains, turkey poop into biofuels? And the BC on the other side of the table, they don't want to look stupid. And they're going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm up on that. No, they're not. Don't believe them. Start by asking and then still explain it like they're five. In this sort of similar space as we were diving headfirst into concrete and cement, which it's really what it felt like. I was diving at first into a block <laughs> of concrete. There, There is so much jargon. There is so much, you know, this aggregate, soft aggregate, hard aggregate. And I think as an investor, you have to sort of go in there with childlike wonder and sort of be okay asking the dumb questions. And I think for the founder, this is the number one thing, you know, the, the PhD thing is so spot on, Molly. I think folks like to think that jargon makes them sound smarter uh-huh. or industry acronyms make them sound smarter. And the thing that I have seen in my career, you know, I don't know, nine, 10 years now as an investor, it's the founders that can sort of break it down into analogies for the layperson to understand that actually know this industry the best. Yes. Because what you've done is you've, you've sort of like understood where your audience is at. And that's a very hard thing to do. It's a lot of what we do on, you know, on the VSE PR side with the agency is say, what story does your audience need to hear from you right now? But if you as a founder can, you know, get even half the way there and just sort of cut the jargon out, use analogies, use sort of simple things that that help people get your message, the biggest thing is the message is memorable. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's the hardest thing to do. But I think so, so few founders get it right. Everybody in this chain, in this value chain, is afraid of looking stupid. Like, it's just the truth. And it took me 20 plus years as a journalist to get comfortable with being like, look, I'm the idiot in the room. I am the stand in for the person who doesn't understand what you're saying. And I just have to keep asking you to explain it over and over. Not everyone is willing to do that. Want to puff up yourself and look smart, like you said, and like, you know, every acronym. A lot of investors are going to nod along as if they understand what you're saying. And then you're going to leave and you're not going to get their money because they didn't get it. You have to believe that they got it and you have to make sure it's gettable and product so market fit and knowing your economics and bottom up TAM. If it was easy, everybody would do it, Molly, <laughs> exactly. right? So, so that, that's a thing that you have to remind uh, <laughs> founders sometimes. Um, so one of the things we, we love to do on the show is, is play a little game called Hyper Hopeful. We'll, we'll talk about a trending topic. I'll ask if it's hyper hopeful and if there's more to unpack, then we'll unpack it. So sound good? I love it. I love a game. 
let's start with sort of Silicon Valley, right? You're, you're based in the Bay. You've spent a lot of time there. We've got tech giants claiming that their technologies are democratizing information, decreasing congestion. But oftentimes we're seeing opposite effects and, and we're seeing that maybe this commitment isn't quite helping us get there. So let's call it big tech or big Silicon Valley's commitment to the climate crisis. Hype or hopeful? All right. If you're sticking me with big tech, can I have both? A lot of it is hype. The idea that like I, if I get a nickel, I'm going to have a billion dollar fund if I get a nickel for every time somebody's like, and AI will help with us, us with climate change because there's zero dollars so far in how. No one says how, right? Oh, they'll just model this or that and then it'll it'll solve big problems like climate change. But what it will do in the short term is require a ton of energy to be trained, the construction of tons more data centers. The more we create, the more we're going to want to use, meaning that there's going to be more and more and more energy in that. That kind of feels like hype. And then you're just sort of promising me that it will totally solve climate change. And I'm like, okay, we'll see. But the hope lies in the possibility that it solves climate change, one. The hope lies in some of the stuff that the companies have actually done partly out of self-interest. Like if I look back at the old days of, you know, even clean tech 1.0, like Google modeled to industry that net zero was possible. So the business practices are where I maybe find some of the hope based on the real the recognition of risk, the need for cheaper energy as a result of having all these data centers. I think there might be more innovation out of necessity than sheer innovation that fall, ends up accidentally being hopeful. I think folks look to to tech now for inspiration in, in these things, right? In in, in a yeah. lot of uh, in a lot of ways, climate is definitely one of those pillars. And so, Microsoft yeah. is a genuine climate leader. Yeah, Google in the for and, and Alphabet have been genuine net zero leaders for the entire industry. Talk to anybody in renewable energy, and they'll be like, "Yeah, they yeah. pioneered the like." the virtual PPA that makes it possible to pop up a solar plant in New York and get the renewable energy credits up from that. Like it's almost like during the pandemic, the reason that the tech companies went home the soonest is because they're the best at exponential thinking. And I do, we're like, the US is awesome at innovation and this industry is awesome at innovation and that changes the world. So that part is very helpful to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we shouldn't throw baby out with the bathwater, right? We, we have big expectations of these folks are not meeting all of them. But the things they are doing are actually pretty hopeful, pretty positive. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So we'll we'll do another one then. Um, we talked about the IRA a little bit. We talked about um, you know government action in this space. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to early stage companies, I see quite a few of these kind of early stage pitches that are talking about IRA, bipartisan infrastructure act, chips act as tailwinds for their companies. I I'm not sold. So I'll ask you, Molly. Government action as a tailwind for early stage startups. Hyper hopeful. We have definitely fallen for this trap before. Like this is the scars of clean tech 1.0, right? Is that all those solar subsidies went away. However, there were also economic realities that left a lot of those VCs holding the bag that had nothing to do with subsidies. And it was China, right? It was being disrupted by super an influx of super cheap solar panels. So I think we have a tendency to blame the reliance on subsidies. So I recently talked to somebody who was like one of the earliest investors in Tesla, and she made the point that Tesla would have died had it not been for government subsidies. The adoption curve of technology is right, the early, the early adoption at the innovator stage, and then potentially the valley of death before mass adoption. It's that valley of death you have to get across after you've like convinced people to spend a lot of money and be cool and be aspirational. How do you make the leap? At least in that case, it was government funding that cross the chasm. And so when companies say it's a tailwind for them, what they should be saying is it will be the catalytic capital that lets us cross the valley of death. And I actually think that if you plan for that, if you make it the gap financing between what venture can do and mass adoption, it's hopeful. Yeah. I, I mean, I think with, with the IRA, especially like it's become a little bit of a political football, but you know, when you look at bipartisan infrastructure act, chips act, like there are real dollars for companies even this early on to access. Mm -hmm. And I think what I love to hear in one of these pitches is like the milestone, right? And how you're going to get there exactly. and how you're going to unlock it. So if you can lay out that roadmap to me as an investor, you know what that makes me think? You're laying out this roadmap for your team as well. Totally. And there's just an inherent trust that you build. Don't come and say, because of the IRA, we're fine now. 
right (laughs) specificity (laughs) is the key to hope (laughs) yeah i you know what i would love to see those ira dollars actually get spent on c state startups but right now it's all project financing and and we're not really uh seeing that in our companies at least but if you're Um, if you're in hardware eventually they get to project finance and that's where they need that money and that's a huge i mean that is a big tailwind for sure that is that is a big unlock that is a big unlock so we'll we'll move away from hyper hopeful thank you for for playing that with us because i want to talk about everybody in the pool Tell us a little bit about kind of where this idea started and maybe one or two of the, the more promising stories that you've been able to cover um, as you've been writing and, and talking about everybody in the pool. Yeah, this is so fun. So this is my new podcast with the company newsletter. I think we're on episode 13. It's just a little it's just a little infant of a podcast, but it is um, my attempt to highlight solutions. I have this like sort of personal belief that if I I've seen somebody do something. I know it's doable. Like, you know, the one time that I ever went skydiving, I was like, I'm very nervous about this. However, I'm strapped to the back of this nice, very efficient German man who does this 15 times a day. So, you know, this is clearly totally doable because he like commutes here with his little coffee, does this 15 times a day and goes home. So to me, the, the goal of this podcast is modeling to show people what's possible. Here are the solutions that exist. I don't want to talk about the problems. Even I, as the biggest nerd on earth, don't want to read any more about interconnection or decarbonization strategies or deep industry, this or that. Like, I just want to know what to do. And I want to know what other people are doing. This is meant to be a very practical, business-oriented show where each week I try to spotlight a lot of startup entrepreneurs, yes, but sometimes just people in industry. I talk to my real estate agent and interior designer about how (laughs) the climate crisis is changing what their customers are asking them for. Yeah, I mean, it's really like... Every job is a climate job. So that's a big, but that's one of my favorite episodes to this day is having my real estate, my personal real estate agent just be like, oh yeah, it's like the cost is measured in smug at this point when you're, it's aspirational to be like, oh, I want to buy a house that already has panels or a battery or, you know, you can sort on multiple listing services. You can now sort by green features and shop for houses that way. Anyway, I just think that stuff is like, I love it. And then like one of the surprising hits I thought it would be really that practical day-to-day stuff. You know, I talked to this company called Finch that is um, a repository for sustainable alternatives to the goods you already buy. Like you just go there and say, I want laundry detergent. And it's like, these ones are the best. And people loved it. But you know what they loved more is the actual hydrogen airplane startup that has flown a plane with a fuel cell that they developed that is not only a fuel cell, but uh, like an espresso style module so that regional jets can be easily retrofitted to take these Nespresso pods that are just delivered through existing cargo so that you don't have to build a network of new hydrogen gas stations all over the world at a cost well, of trillions I'm not surprised that was popular. I'm not surprised. That's, that's, that's cool sci-fi. Hell. That's the Jetsons right there. So, yeah. Yes. And they've flown. <laughs> they flew a real plane. Like, it's so cool. I'm going to make sure we uh, we link both of those episodes uh, in our show notes. Um, Molly, this was this is so fun. I want to close with a question we close with all of our guests on, and we hinted at it in the beginning of our conversation, given your time covering uh, tech and and even climate tech for some time now, there is so much doom and gloom in the climate reporting world. Where do you draw your optimism from and kind of what have you seen over the years that keeps you optimistic about this fight against climate change? It is 100, at least here, it is the innovators and the investors and the economics like I'm getting a weird amount of hope from people in finance, like deep in finance, who are just saying, this is where the money is going and I have to get on that train. But honestly, what I really draw my hope from is the idea of everybody, like everybody's doing something. It's the very rare person, I think, at this point who is completely unaware or who doesn't have a kid at home saying something. It's like, we're moving. It's happening. We're moving. And there are great ideas coming out of the woodwork every day. And it's thrilling to watch. I think it's a great note to leave it on. I mean, if you are looking uh, for hope and inspiration as you feel the the climate anxiety, um, yeah, look around you. There is probably somebody in your very immediate vicinity that is working on this problem. And I think that's uh, that's only going to grow. That's only going to continue. So Molly Wood, thank you so much for joining me on Climb by VSE. This was a fantastic conversation. And I am so excited uh, about what you're doing with Mollywood Media. I'm looking forward to finding things for us to do together. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it. This is such a treat. Yeah, let's let's co-invest or something. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, that's all for this week's episode of Climb by VSC. Thank you so much for watching and listening. 
Special thanks to Credo for their help in producing and promoting this episode. To visit any part of today's conversation again, you can find the full transcript on vscventures.com. Our thanks to Josue Romero for posting these every week. Lastly, if you've listened this far, please leave us a rating on Spotify or review on iTunes. It only takes a few seconds, really helps us out, and as far as I know, it's still carbon neutral. Well, that's all for now. We'll see you all next week on Climb by VSC.